there was an industrialization that was taking place. And in Germany, in the 19th century, somebody said, well, when we use some sort of educational process to help in this way of working together so that we can live more human lives, uh, we call that pedagogy, social pedagogy. And they coined that word. Other people maybe have been doing it, but they, they actually named this as social pedagogy. And policy, social policy, practice and theory that addresses social issues by, quote, educational means. So, say you've got uh, what someone I know used to call the uncouth youth ha hanging about on street corners and, uh, you know, making themselves known, a presence, a presence in the area. Uh, you can work with that in all sorts of ways. You can bring in youth justice. Uh, you could say the problems with housing. They're not the houses up homes aren't out of let's build more homes, whatever, whatever, whatever. But you could bring in something like youth, youth services as a more of a sort of educational approach, supporting their development as young people. And from a policy point of view, that could be called social pedagogy. So at the moment, I'm only talking about policy, because that's one, one way of thinking about social pedagogy. It's those measures that are brought in to address social issues by educational <coughs> means. Instead of, say, justice, housing, welfare, protection. Or alongside those. So it's not saying the others have no place. It's just that this is what, at the policy level, governments or voluntary organisations, local authorities, working with that model, that's a can be called a social pedagogic model. Now, one of the problems is with the word social pedagogy. And people from different countries pronounce it in different ways. Some people say pedagogy, some people say pedagogy, uh, and I say pedagogy because that phonetically that's, that makes sense to me. But I remember talking to some people in Northern Ireland, and, and one of them said, who'd been trained by uh, German speaking people, he said, What's all this pedo? And he could hardly bring himself to say the word pedagogy, he said. And, and so I said, Well, that's what I say, but everybody's free to say what they like. And then that evening in the bar, he said, Would you like a pint of gin? <laughs> so, it's probably educational, it, it's not schooling, it's connected to upbringing and ed education in its broadest sense, it could be very easily applied to fostering or residential care, and it's aware of the social as well as the individual. So, aware that everybody exists in a cultural, legal, political context, and they're all impinging on them and how they're developing, how they're supporting, supported, how uh, policy reacts to them and positions them and supports them or pulls them right out from underneath them in some cases. Um, in practice, and I'll go into a lot more details next time, uh, after, after copying about practice. But in practice, you have to think of it as a, an ethical practice. It's a conviction. I believe in this way of working. Uh, it's a professional and a personal way of working. It draws <laughs> on theory. There's a whole development of uh, theoretical models of ways of, of looking at, at the work. And it's not a technique or a tool. It's not a method that you say, this is what it is, this is what I do here, here, this is what I do there. It's 
a way of being with human beings in a creative way that respects equality and respects other human beings. And Gandhi's expression of uh, wish that he says, live, live the change you want to make. So the social pedagogue, the person who is a professional or somebody who's working in that, uh, that, that professional context or <coughs> whatever, isn't there to lay down the law about you have to be, you, you have to treat that person as an equal to yourself. They're there as, in a way, role models that their way of interacting with other people is actually living the change they want to make. So that's the sort of conviction level, the uh, way of holding yourself in your dealings with other people. Uh, I'll just flag up now some fairly familiar folks, <coughs> educational thinkers and practitioners from other countries. I'll mention Pestalozzi particularly, who's Swiss but with an Italian name. And because he said, in this work, you work with your head, your heart, and your hands. And the Fostering Networks program that has been undertaken in Staffordshire as well as up and down the country is called Head, Heart, and Hands <coughs> because of that. So he was a practitioner, much more than he was a, 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 a theoretician. He's very influential. He was in correspondence with, with people in the UK, and they with him some of our uh, 18th century and later Enlightenment thinkers. Froebel, heard of the Froebel movement uh, in preschool. Steiner in Croatia. Montessori, uh, the, again, in, in early years. Am I in your way there? No, I can look around you. Okay. And uh, Paulo Freire uh, from Brazil, who was in adult education. I'll, I'll return to Paulo Freire and tell a bit later. And we had these, these key figures in, in, uh, in England who were working in this way. They were working in a broadly educational way rather than in the way of, of, for example, workhouses. I don't know who, who you think is most familiar out of those names. Bernardo. Bernardo, yes. Yeah, I mean, that bit. But she was very active in the suffragette movement. She was. Oh. Yes. Uh, Robert Owen. Robert Owen. Yes. And uh, he opened uh, model factories mm -hmm. with communities, housing, school attached. I keep thinking about Capri Hall. Yeah, yeah Capri and Rountree. Yes, Rountree. yes. yes. This broadly educational as well as other measures way of, of supporting people in the population. Um, I must say, uh, Thomas Coram, because I've come from the Thomas Coram Research Unit, uh, they, they base their system on the education of children, abandoned children, and they took in, into their uh, institutions uh, and gave them education in music apart from anything else. But many other subjects as well. Bernardo, who said that we can't just wear <coughs> these children in huge uh, orphanages. They really need a house mother living in cottages. So we used to, used to uh, say 12 children per cottage. So it was perhaps not really how we would think of a sort of cosy domestic situation. But nevertheless, it was based on their relationship with a house mother. Uh, and in the case of the boys, the house brother. <coughs> uh, Emily Pedic whose photograph was up at the beginning. Some people say, is that you? <laughs> Today. And Mary Neal, uh, among my uh, heroines, they were working in right through to the middle of the last century 
Um, and they opened a, 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 a girl, girls' club for people working in the textiles industry in uh, central London. And this is what Emily wrote. She said, when my friend Mary Lee started the club, it was the first idea of making the club their home, where all who came would find welcome, sympathy, companionship, interest, amusement. Building up a club of human, in the club, human relationships that would influence and uplift the rest of their lives. Social pedagogy centers on the rela relationship between individuals and between people as members of our, our, our same society. Um, they were also quite critical of what they were finding. They started off in terms of, let's, let's get them to, uh, you know, we, we'll make their life better, we'll give them worthwhile things to do. And then they found out the conditions that these young women were working in, in the textile industry and uh, tailoring. Local, uh, very long hours, poor working conditions, poor ventilation, poor pay. And they actually thought, you know, we've got to address this as well. So they got them to, some of them to join the union. They themselves set up a model tailor's shop for them to, to work in, to get, set an example for local. So they're aware of the social context. They knew that the individual relationship was highly important. That's where the work is done. But they knew that what was affecting that was all the rest of society, what was happening in society. So that's just a bit of background taken from you know, far off history. Uh, in this country, we've been there's been development of social pedagogy since the end of the 90s, middle of the 90s, end of the 90s, or some discussion. Uh, then I was commissioned by the Department of Health in those days, in 99, I think, to find out more about social pedagogy in Europe. Particularly, they're interested in residential care. But my big question was, what, what is it? Now, I've come across pedagogues in my European research already, but I thought I knew what they were. Of course, I know what a social pedagogue is. It's a residential worker, or uh, somebody who works in children's out of school services. Yeah, that's what, that's a social pedagogue. I know that. And then I found that the more I went into it, and the people I was working with, we all went over to different countries in Europe. And we interviewed a lot of people. And it, it got deeper than that. Uh, so over the 90th, you know, the, the early years of this century, uh, we carried out a lot of different research projects looking at social pedagogy and family support, social pedagogy and residential care, training for social pedagogy, social pedagogy in the arts, something that brought about afterwards. Uh, and, and, and foster care, and so on. Uh, so that's part of the picture. And as a result of some of that work, other people also became interested and active. There were demonstration projects. Uh, Tempra was involved in a demonstration project in Lancashire in the, about 2007 or something. They did a demonstration project in uh, Essex, in residential care. The Department for Education asked us at Tom's School Research Unit to do a demonstration project in residential. And Staffordshire was a member of that. Uh, well, he volunteered to be a member of that demonstration project. So there's been a lot of research, there's been a lot of recruitment of social pedagogues as well as, I'm sure you meet, hands up as anybody here who's a social pedagogue. Four, four at the moment. Uh, and but there are people who won't be identified as social pedagogues, but who qualified as social pedagogues 
strong social workers, perhaps in other countries, and who are working as social workers in this country. Last time I spoke to a recruit, one recruitment agency, they said they placed 200 social pedagogues in this country recently. Um, so, so how's it been working out? Well, of all the different training, and lots of different local authorities have asked for training, there have been nine independent evaluations of some of that. They also commissioned, the local authorities <coughs> commissioned independent evaluations. Uh, and my colleague Claire Cameron has just reviewed these nine uh, evaluations, finding remarkably similar results. And this was about the impact of training on staff in residential homes, some social workers and foster carers. They found that what was happening was that the care, uh, people were beginning to speak the same language across the different professions. So social workers and foster carers were thinking in the same sort of way and can, could communicate more easily. And teamwork and uh, getting on with one another, communicating, improved. Uh, and basically, it, it, it was a good thing. And the strange thing is that these sorts of findings were across all nine. You think you're reading the same report. Uh, I think mean, there are other findings. For example, in some places, Edinburgh, they're happy to say that they have reduced costs as a result of introducing social pedagogy. Because one reason is that placements are much more separate. Uh, Derbyshire is finding a, a similar picture. So things are moving on, and they're moving on in a, in a positive way, but very small beginnings very small beginnings of money. So Staffordshire's introduction of social pedagogy into residential foster care and last year into adoption services are uh, a part of the development of UK social pedagogy. And why? But it does help things out the relationships between social workers and foster carers. It does uh, provide a, a useful, all sorts of useful ways of thinking and being for foster carers, but basically it's wanting the best for the children. So that's yeah. happy, happy to take any questions of it if, if this is the time to do that. Uh, yeah, obviously people have got questions for today, feel free to, to share them. <coughs> Russo. Russo's up there. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, no problem. Mm. Hume, Godwin. Yeah. Yeah.